And I clicked back into the game to make it work because this game does not run unless, uh, does not actually play any audio unless you are clicked into it. So um, I'm Matthew Rory from GiantBomb.com. I am George, joined by George Zeitz. Zeitz. Yep. Correct. Okay, good. I'm Now that's in my head where I think I'm mispronouncing it. I'm probably going to be second thinking about every time I say the word. Uh, we're raising money this weekend for um, Pencils of Promise, this charity that raises uh, money for classrooms in underdeveloped nations across the world. We're trying to raise about 17000 I think we're a lot of the way there. But if you want to uh, donate, I believe I have a donation link uh, that I tweeted out and then forgot to put anywhere else. But let me find that real quick and put that into chat room real quick. It, it, honestly, the, the donation link at the top of the chat room on Giant Bomb uh, will go to the team page. More than welcome to uh, donate to the team in general. If you'd like to donate to my personal fundraiser, I have tweeted that into the chat room and I'll throw it into the t- t- Twitch chat as well. How about that? Uh, thank you for joining me on a wonderful Sunday. Uh, we're here to talk about Neverwinter Nights 2, Storm of Zaheer, as indicated by this wonderful splash screen. Um, that is a joke. We are here to talk about Neverwinter Nights 2, Mask of the Betrayer. Uh, you were uh, Explain your title on Mask of the Betrayer. I, I, you said before that you were the, it was your first lead position. Lead writer? Lead narrative designer? I was so... Uh, it was creative lead, um, which... Back then, we were sort of like narrative designer wasn't really a thing, and narrative mm-hmm. lead wasn't really a thing. So that was sort of this weird intermediate period where it was called creative lead, or at least at Obsidian it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but essentially, I was the narrative lead on the project. And uh, you were working closely with uh, Kevin Saunders as he, I, I believe, lead designer was his title as well? Yeah. I mean, Ke- Kevin uh, multitasked on that project. Yeah. He, he did lead design, and it, but it was more in, the, in terms of like systems design. Sure. A lot of what he focused on, and and then he was also the producer on the project. Yeah. So he was not only doing the design, the sort of gameplay uh, systems design side. He was also doing uh, all the production and project management side. Yeah. Of things. So he did he did a lot. I worked with him on uh, Storm Is Here, uh, and we'll talk about maybe some of my uh, background as well. I'm going to go ahead and get into let's let's load up this little like kind of as we talk about things. I'll, I'll kind of go through the the beginning. This is the famous kind of um, uh, I don't know what the word for it is, but kind of the the pur- purgatory you're launched into when you start yeah. off the game. If you, lobby, yeah. yeah, if you haven't made so if you if you're not familiar with Mask of Betrayer, it is the expansion pack to uh, Neverwinter Nights Two. Um, I, f- I forget if Neverwinter Nights Two had a subtitle, um, but Mask of Betrayer was the first nope. expansion pack. And as you start the game, if you didn't import a character from the first game, which I did not have a, a character save, uh, you have to basically go through this little purgatory and do the leveling up. Um, Leveling up process. This is kind of an interesting little way of getting you because you have to be level 18 to start the expansion because it is kind of an epic, epic level expansion. Um, I have gone to trust, trust me. I'm not going to go through the uh, entire character creation process again. I've already done this, but I, I wanted to kind of talk chat real quick about this aspect of the game because you do start off at level 18. It's a very high level for a D&D, any, any kind of D&D campaign that would be extremely high level. And I, I bet that would take a lot of gameplay balancing was that a challenge in, in making this kind of expansion because I know with like KOTOR 2 you went to level 30 and it felt like at some point the uh, you know maybe as a, as a writer it wasn't quite your wheelhouse but, I, but combat balancing in epic levels always seems like it would be a quite the task to do yeah v- very very much so um, yeah it was incredibly difficult not only to balance and make interesting fights but um, to have enough enemies that we could actually do something with like sure. later in the game uh you'll run into like some some epic level gnolls and things mm-hmm. like that which is a little ridiculous but yeah it was just kind of what we had to do to make the game at least marginally challenging from a <laughs> combat perspective it's interesting to me as a you know i play these games i love the uh, stories and all these rpgs and everything like that but I, I do play very combat focused and a lot of times i'm less into the role-playing mechanics of these kind of games than i am in like the uh, experience of story and and playing uh, you know usually fighting a lot of stuff i, I was very much much an Icewind Dale kind of person because I was very combat oriented but Massive Betrayer really impressed me a lot with its story as well so I did kind of try to soak it in I've played this game um, 
multiple times, and I should say as we get in here, let me load up this first game. We're going to start pretty much right from the beginning of this. Um, this game takes place right uh, pretty much immediately after the end of Neverwinter Nights 2. Uh, you find yourself uh, the main character uh, or transported into the this barrow, and you don't don't really know much about what's going on here. The shard in your chest that was a big part of the first game has been removed from you, um, and you have no idea where you are or why you're there or why you're alone and why there's a big hole in your chest. Um, all this is eventually explained a little bit over time, but it does obviously take a, takes a while too. Do you find it interesting to write this kind of narration during dialogue? Is it? Are you more of a dialogue person or more kind of a, um, you know, kind of explanations? Is it more tedious to do this kind of stuff and make it sound interesting, or is it um, something you you look forward to as like a way to explain uh, uh, explain the world? I actually don't mind doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I I would say I enjoy both. Um, there are writers I know that that I work with who hate writing narrative text. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it varies per writer, but nice I actually kind of like. It. I know Nabokov was always uh, very much uh, dismissive of dialogue as a, a storytelling device. He, he was very much more into um, blocks of explanation, or I forget the word narrative. I, I, I'm just babbling now. Uh, so this is. Uh, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I was just going to say the. Um, my name is Sophia. Uh, the, the dialogue that I find easiest and most fun to write is stiff, when there's two characters playing off each other. I actually find the hardest thing for me is writing just the player and one other person. Mm -hmm. Let me know in the uh, crowd if this... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I need to figure out if I can make this work in the uh, the background here because I am trying to adjust audio stuff and it's pausing the game every time. So I have questions. We sleep now before the spirits wake. Uh, you, as Sophia, you don't really know her at this point, but this is Sophia and her friend, her, um, her familiar, and she is trying to explain to you... I, I was looking up the story of this, and so you came from the Sword Coast, and you are now in Rashomon, and you spend a lot of time in Rashomon and Thay. Um, I'll take you to her and make certain that she gives us both some answers. Sophia is a red wizard of Thay, kind of a, I, I wouldn't ex has it explained, like a, a junior member, but she definitely has uh, higher orders of her, of, her, of her order, higher members of her order that she does have to um, answer to, I suppose. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, um, she's part of a, a school of magic. I'm that and um, more, but I'm not. There are senior people who sent her here. At least, disregard whatever rumors you have heard regarding the Red Wizards. I am here to assist you, and I will do just that. I am going to get out of this conversation real quick, and we'll get back to talking about this. Um, so, real quick, let me open up my my series of questions here. Um, I, I wanted to also really quickly uh, talk about. Uh, I mentioned Storm of the Year before, so my background of this game and the uh, Neverwinter Nights franchise is that I wrote the official strategy guide for. Um, while I while I adjust this spell book real quick, uh, we'll talk about me and you and everything else. So I, I worked on the official strategy guide for a Throne of Ball or Bale. I always forget how to pronounce that one. Um, uh, yeah, so I wrote, did that for Versus Books. I uh, worked. I don't remember having a lot of contact with anybody at uh, Black Isle for that one. But then I wor went on to do uh, game guides for Neverwinter Nights Two and um, Mask of the Betrayer. I wrote the game guide of this for uh, GameSpot. Um, and then at some point after that and before Storm of the Year came out, um, Fergus uh, was talking to my boss at GameSpot and he kind of was looking for someone to do this kind of marketing PR role. Uh, so I came on board after, oh, definitely after Mask of the, Be of the Beshire came out um, and before Storm of the Year did, I'm going to load up on Magic Missile. I don't know if Magic Missile is actually a really useful so, I mean, it can't miss right so it's usually one of the good spells to have um, it is. It, it's actually really good for the high level um, because you do get a whole bunch of magic missiles mm -hmm. up to a certain point okay yeah 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 I um, I know there's improved magic missiles as well it has been a very very long time since I played this game so bear with me a little bit here she does not have the strength spell that's interesting um, and I, uh, by the way, Matt, one other thing, the um, the meta magic spells are quite useful in this mm -hmm. game. Uh, obviously not at first level, but sure. you can get like uh, improved um, some of those like magic missile and yeah. the, uh, Isaac's, Isaac's uh, I forget the name of it now, but the Isaac's missile or whatever they're called. Um, you can get like improved versions of them mm -hmm. um, that are 
really good. So these are the feats. So the meta magic is, I know it's been a long time since I played this game, but meta magic, the extend spell and power spell, these are feats that you can do to make lower level spells pop up into higher level spell slots. Um, she does not, she has haste, which is good. Upgrade a magic weapon. I'm, I, it's, like I said, it's been a very, very long time since I played this game, so I'll probably just leave most of these spells as they are for now. Um, and I'll dig into this in between play sessions as we go. Um, but so, yeah, I came onto Obsidian uh, during the, the building of Storm is a Here, which was a interesting experience because it was certainly the second expansion pack to a game. And one of the things I wanted to kind of ask you was uh, how an expansion pack is built. Because I, I know when I was working on Fallout New Vegas, it was kind of contractually built into the idea that. That there was going to be a certain number of expansion packs, and I know I've read that. Um, here's Kaji as well. You wanted to say something about Kaji, I believe. And one of the things I, I real quick with, um, with uh, Sophia, uh, Sophia, is that the correct, correct pronunciation? Yep, yep, Sophia. Um, she, the first companion you get in an RPG has to be kind of. Um, I guess not always has to be, but it feels like it's very, she especially is kind of built to be kind of whatever character you created, you, she's going to be useful to you. She shouldn't overlap too much. And Kaji is a big part of that because he will do a lot of your lock picking throughout the game. So it felt yep. kind of like you, you went two for one on this one with a familiar. Um, and it, it's always kind of interesting to see, especially when you're doing a character created RPG, what the first kind of companion you see is because sometimes they can be, I remember, I forget what specific game it was, but um, oh, here's we go. The influence meter here was, we should talk about that oh, yeah. as well. Um, but here it really felt like Sophia was meant to be kind of a jack of all trades. She can buff, she can do combat, she can use her uh, crossbow and everything else. Speaking of the devil, let me give her that crossbow, um, which she to, should. To, to some extent, that that's true. I mean, she's, she's really important to the plot. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so I didn't mean to diminish her in that way, but. No, 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 and that's uh, the 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 important point. There is um, you brought up Kaji, and Kaji is a thief. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any thief companions, um, so he has all of the rogue skills. Um, and part of the reason that we paired him with Sophia uh, is to increase the odds that the player would actually take Sophia with them, um, because if if there's no other thief companions and their player themselves are not a thief, then they're going to want to bring Kaji along to take care of lock chests and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so she is definitely an, an intentional twofer. All right. I'm trying to turn you up again. Uh, apparently somebody is saying that you are still quiet. Sorry about that. Let me know, Tao, if your uh, mm, George is a little okay. bit better. Please talk some more, George. I apologize for that. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm talking at a pretty good volume here. But, okay. Um, it's I probably something internal, too. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's something I think it's something internal to Discord. I, I've had this problem constantly with Discord, okay. um, so I think it's just something with that. But hopefully, let me know in chat if uh, George is loud enough to hear now. Uh, you are in this barrow. It is uh, unstable. You are trying to get out as quick as you can. Um, I brought around spare weaponry for me to use. Um, and one of the things about this expansion that I, I forget if uh, Weapon Master, I've always been kind of a Weapon Master oriented kind of player. I like big, big stuff to use. I got a cloak. Why is this not on me? Go and put that on. Um, let me get a something from her to use. I'll take that quarter staff, I suppose, um, without any other weapons. I have made this character into a Weapon Master scythe. Um, Still quieter than me for sure, man. I can only turn this this volume slider all the way up. It makes me feel like I'm maybe not doing this right at all. I'm gonna turn you pretty much all the way up here, and we'll see if that okay. works out. Um, so one of the things about Weapon Master's size in this game is that I, I feel like I'm bouncing all over the walls here, but I think I'm gonna go back to my original point about the expansion pack. So Never When I was Two, the contract was to built in with at least one expansion pack, right? When Obsidian got the task to make N NWN Two. I think so. So I, I wasn't really on the business side back sure. then. Um, my understanding was that, um, well, actually, no, y you are right, because they had us start to work on this before Neverwinter Nights yeah. 2 even shipped. Um, the second one might have been dependent upon sale. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to say that was, I mean, it was obviously very interesting to work uh, with, I don't know if you had to deal a lot with Atari directly or if you're more working with, I mean, so the publishing structure was Atari Infograms, uh, previously Infograms, was making this game or publishing this game. And then uh, obviously Wizards of the Coast Hasbro was the IP owner who had to approve a lot of stuff. And I did yeah. want to talk about that a little bit, too, because we, we ran into some some interesting kind of parts of that on um 
Vault here. We go. The Earth Essences are coming in. We ran into some of that on Stormzy here in terms of what they would and would not approve of um, from a you know property holder kind of uh, stance. I remember there are some screenshots that I was trying to take for Stormzy here as well. Um, where they were they rejected it as being too violent, and it took me like I, I worked for like a day on these. Okay, so I can put Z for picking up stuff. Let me go and grab Dagger. I got a City of Judgment. Let me, if you have any pro tips for me playing this game, I'm probably going really, really <laughs> slow here, but uh, I'm just kind of going to. No, no, you're, you're fine. Uh, it's this is intentional, this is intended to be a, a kind of a quieter area mm -hmm. um, where you're kind of just exploring around. That the book that you found, the City yeah. of Judgment, is. Um, Here we go there later on. A, uh, it, it becomes very important, yeah, later in the game. Um, it's it. Looking back on it, I probably put a little too much uh -huh. uh, foreshadowing in there, but it was very much an intended intended to be a foreshadow. I'm curious about it because um, I remember I read you that you thought that you were one of the good things about this game was that you uh, kind of felt like you were uh, left alone by uh, the the people. You were, well, wasn't a lot of oversight in terms of what you were and were not allowed to do. But then I also yep. read that you uh, eventually at the end of the game you do uh, have the opportunity to get your own soul out of the wall of the faithless and you uh, originally one of the endings was supposed to be you were supposed to be able to destroy the wall of the faithless which is um, a kind of a, a, a depository of lost souls who have been you know people who are atheist or unbelievers uh, by Kelimvor if I'm if I'm summing that up correctly um, and originally one of the things that you wanted to do was to oh shit trap oh dear I should probably let this guy move forward can I quick save in this game I always forget um, so it was really interesting to hear that because I, it, apparently one of their feedbacks was um, that they didn't want you to make any kind of major, possibly permanent changes to the realm of you know Forgotten Realms Afterworld um, as part of the, the the plot of this game. But then also at the same time, you do you are able to actually. Oh, here we go. My name was Nakata. Memories. I apologize if I keep on pausing, but I'll, I will have to see if I can make this run in the background. Try to skip through and look at questions from chat and uh, Twitch as well. Right. I will get back to your question just sure, sure. She's this little scene is done. Because this is an important scene, too. We'll tear out your throat and pry it from your ghost. Die in these caverns and you'll find no easy road to your realm of death. My name is a uh, pre-randomly uh, generated name. Leave? No, <laughs> you will not. Something was trapped in the cavern of runes. Poison at the heart of our dream. Swallowing memories and names. Anything that emerges from there cannot be allowed to walk free. Those were the words of our god. What he sank into slumber. She's referring to Aku, correct? Yep. I will see. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I, the first time I played this game, I think I was an evil one. I, I think as I was reading my walkthrough, I played a somewhat evil. Um, but I might try to play this one a little bit good. One of the big things to worry about here. Oh, let her. Finish. Well, I guard the way. Go back the way you came. <laughs> what is that scent? Blood. A wound that should have been mortal, but was not. Something deeper, vile and familiar. Why do I remember? At once, the presence twists within you, crushing the breath from your lungs. A wild groan rises in your ears, like an animal that has hungered for centuries untold, yet been unable to feed and unable to die. Then the groan rises in a scream. You can see nothing, hear nothing. Your flesh seems to burst apart in ribbons, the hunger erupting from within. I love that thing. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a really cool looking um, uh, little thing that pops up. You better run away too, buddy. A spell or a divine invocation. How did you do that? That was uh, Justin Cherry, our, our art lead on, um, on this game. Mm-hmm. 
uh, who's now at Turtle Rock, uh, no shit. created that. They He's healed. super talented Brilliant. artist. Yeah, he Brilliant did all of our key art, I think, for the games that we were working on as well. Um, he and Brian Menzi and, and all the artists on these games are just uh, fantastic. Uh, fantastic. I, I, I believe Justin Cherry did the um, Storm is a Here key art as well with the, the snake going yep. through the skull. Um, he was yep. a big part of Obsidian. I haven't really fall, ca- caught up with a lot of Obsidian people over the years. I, I saw Avalon at E3 a few years ago, but um, apart yep. from that, it's been, a, it's been a long time. Let me try to see if I can make this run in the background. Um, and if I can, that would obviously help me kind of uh, tab out to look at questions without being too... I'm not sure that's let, even an option. Let me, let me uh, answer the question that sure. you were talking about earlier. So, um, as far as like um, publisher or other external forces like uh, getting involved in the the creation of this game, um, one of the things that happens in a lot of games is you know many different um, parties are kind of kind of get their hands into into the game, and and as a result of that, even if the intentions are good. Uh, if you get too many cooks in the kitchen, it, it can just yeah. end up with a very kind of muddled feeling game. That did not happen with this game. Like mm-hmm. this was very much under the radar. Um, Chris Avalone, who was the, um, the the chief creative at Obsidian at the time, was like, "Do whatever you want to do. I will support you." And he ended up doing some writing on this game, but very supportive. It wasn't in the sense of like, "You should change this and you should add that." It was like, you know, whatever your vision is, I want to find a way to support it. Um, and he was really the only one uh, of, of the owners or of external people who were really looking too closely at what we were doing. Sure. Um, the thing with uh, Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast, uh, particularly with the wall, was less um, them seeing it and coming in and saying, you can't do this or that. Um, but there was a rule at the beginning, and I think this was a rule of most of the games that Wizards of the Coast or D and D games that you know were were um, where the IP was owned by Wizards. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a general rule that you couldn't do anything in a video game that would permanently change the world. Like okay. it sort of had to be everything on a very high level would have to sort of be reset or just not changed by the end. Yeah. Um, I actually wish I had challenged that. I think I said this in, in an interview at some yeah. point um, with the wall because, sure enough, like it uh, when when D and D Fourth Edition came out, they actually got rid of the wall anyway. Um, so I sort of wish I had been like, "What do you think of us taking down the wall in this?" And I wonder what would have happened. But yeah, I didn't. I just assumed you couldn't. Do it. It's a, it's a very kind of uh, one of those things where rights owners really do uh, you know have a, a vested interest in keeping the integrity of their their works together and, and making sure that they are not you know um, uh, you look at it, I'm sure like everybody who makes anything based on a Marvel property probably has a whole Bible oh, full yeah. of full of stuff to um, try to try to adhere to I mean the Bibles and and you know uh, working guidelines and everything like that are, are important on any kind of licensed property it's it's always going to happen. And it's always kind of a good thing when when you get a little bit of leeway to work with. I mean, I, I don't know if you worked on Kotor two or, or any of those previous Obsidian games, but I did, I did not. Yeah, I'm assuming Star Wars is, has probably the the longest and most complicated kind of bible of them all in terms of what you are and are not allowed to do. Let me get some of these. Oh, she hasn't rested, so she doesn't have any um, bears endurance. One of the the things I always remember about these games is the kind of constant. Um, uh, buffing after a rest in in these games is kind of a big, big important thing to do. I want to say, does this have mass bears endurance and mass um, uh, the the mass of these spells? I, I th- want to say this one did, where you could, or maybe it was Storm is a hero that added it, so you can cast them on your entire party at the same time. Uh, it's such it a, might be at a it might be at a higher level, or it might be one of the meta magics. Might be. I'm not sure. I remember definitely it's in uh, Storm is a hero, uh, but I want to say it's in this game as well. So what you do after you if you're not familiar with D and D, basically after you rest, you're going to be casting these kind of uh, buff spells on your entire party to get them more AC, more spell resistance, and everything like that. Uh, it's a big part of the game um, and it is kind of laborious but it's also one of those things that oh there we go okay I should really be having Kaji kind of take the lead here um, let me go back to my list of questions here real quick as well I was really curious about the the Hasbro thing because when I worked when I worked with them on Storm is a Hero they had some pushback on some things but uh, I think Storm is a Hero is a unique kind of um, 
was kind of a unique circumstance because I was very inexperienced in my role as kind of marketing PR. Um, and the person I was working with at Atari was very inexperienced. I think he was one of the junior kind of uh, PR people over there as well. So it was kind of a perfect storm of uh, people not really knowing what they do. I really wish I could remember if there was a quick save in this game. But I'm not sure that there is. Um, so it was uh, one of those things where I, I was asked, I remember very specifically, I was asked to make 200 print quality screenshots for Storm Busy here. Whoa. Um, yeah, it was like, we need to give everybody like, you know, 40 of them. And I think that was his kind of, you know, uh, kind of junior in uh, request. And I brought... Uh, Fergus took one. Well, they they don't need that many. They, there's no no reason to do that many. So this hill was a city. Um, but luckily, I mean, it's good to have hands off. But it does it's like anything else. But when you have like uh, constraints in budget or constraints in storytelling, it does kind of force you to be creative. But uh, I think this game probably turned out much the better for not having to deal with too much oversight or anything like that. So well, we're all the better off for it. Um, so I was actually really curious about your lead. I forget, we talked about your title before, but you worked on Neverwinter Nights to the base game. And was there like a kind of a obvious, you know, you wanted to be the lead or was it uh, some a competition or uh, was it just kind of a, something that uh, the owners felt like you were ready for the next kind of challenge? Yeah, it was, it was more the latter. Um, so on Neverwinter Nights 2, um, I was one of the designers on uh, Act 2. So for each of the acts of the game, there were three acts of the game. There was a team because mm-hmm. they were it was such a big game. Yeah. Um, each of the acts was almost like the size of Mask of the Betrayer. Um, so it was it was me and it was Eric Fenstermaker and Jeff Huskis on Act Two, uh, and all three of us, along with Tony Evans, ended up on on this uh, on this expansion. Um, so when I came into Neverwinter Nights Two in like November of 2005, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did some stuff with the uh, <laughs> the infamous tutorial, uh, and then I did a whole bunch of things on on Act Two. Um, and I guess uh, Chris Avalone liked the narrative things that I did because um, he just one day randomly called me into his office and said, "Hey, would you like to be the narrative lead on uh, on the expansion?" And I was like, "Sure." I didn't even know anyone was thinking about that. Um, and and it, it it worked out nicely because the story that we ultimately ended up telling in this game was something that was sort of in some form floating around in my head at the time anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, It it was very different, but some of the seeds of it were there. Um, uh, You've you've talked about that uh, in some of your interviews. Um, You've talked about like kind of having it gestating in your mind for a long time. And you knew that you wanted to kind of work with, uh, you said, Slavic mythology and um, Japanese mythology, which obviously comes out in Aku uh, quite a bit. Um, but I also remember that you said you were very interested in getting away from goblins and orcs and all that kind of stuff, um, kind of the cliche fantasy stuff. Um, and I think that, so the, that was the reasoning behind the teleportation to uh, this, this is uh, what's it called? Uh, Rashomon? 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 Yeah. Um, so it was, or uh, Rash, Rashomon or something like that? Rashomon. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, that was very intentional. Like, a lot of D&D games at that time, and really still, were in that very sort of classic Western European kind of fantasy setting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the, the Sword Coast is essentially like Western Europe or England. Um, and it, was, it felt very done. I didn't really feel like I personally could tell a particularly interesting story, or at least one that would grab me. Sure. Um, and, and I need to be excited, like, in order to tell a good story. Um, I need to be excited about the, the ingredients I'm working with. Um, so they didn't give me any uh, any specific um, guidelines as to where I could or couldn't do it. So I was like, this looks like an interesting place. And I actually spent a couple weeks um, when they first told me I was going to be doing the narrative on it, um, looking at the, the source books and kind of figuring out the best place that, that I thought would be really interesting to set one of these games. Um, and Rashomon and Thay, Thay was already kind of known to people because um, the Red Wizards of Thay are kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of how the whole story came to be. Is it's like I kind of picked the area oh, and shit. then nope. and Sorry. some other things that that were interesting elements, and then just sort of came up with a story to fit it all together. I'm going to turn off her spellcasting. One of the things I do in um, all these games is turn off follower spellcasting. I like to control that as much as I can. Uh, honestly, yes. Sophia is uh, pretty decent at just plunking away with her uh, crossbow. Um, she's not by any means the most uh, 
powerful person in the, the game. But uh, I'm playing this on normal, by the way. I mostly generally play these games on hardcore just because I find that using AoE spells and casting them right on top of your party is kind of a cheat mode. Um, but it has been so long since I played that I'm going to play this on normal for now. Um, we did have a question from chat, though. Um, how much of this game was planned during the development of the base game? Uh, Neverland 2 has a controversial ending. Was that planned long in advance as a way to set up this expansion? I'm guessing probably not, but um, I'll let you speak to it. <laughs> no, definitely not. So the ending to uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, um, basically this, this this whole place collapses and, and you don't know what happened to your party and to, the, the, uh, uh, and to you even. Um, More Emiskari To rooms. some extent, this, this was us. Covered by accident, like um, the there's even a few room. moments where we, we explicitly do this, where we almost make fun of the ending a little bit. Sure. Because um, some of the team was a little bit like, eh, this isn't like the ending that we would have chosen for this. Um, and so this was very much us being like, we are going to get away from that whole thing. And like the shard being ripped out of your chest um, was partly to kind of that, like, to get out of Neverwinter Nights 2 and, and go to this other thing. Um, and obviously the shard comes back in again. Um, but but yeah, it was... Uh, we weren't thrilled internally with the whole palace collapses ending either. Um, was so it we kind, kind of, of a uh, a budgetary or just time constraint kind of thing? I actually don't... I don't even know where that ending came from. I don't know if that was... Um, oh, shit. Yeah, I don't know. I really, I'm not sure why that, that ended up that way. Well, it's also, I imagine, oh boy, I'm getting rocked here. Holy shit, dude, I might need to rest up outside and come back in a bit. I hope I save my game. Are you doing anything, Sophia? You're not even, you're not even fucking attacking. Come on, use your, use your words. I should probably have her actually trying to cast them. So I think I'm going to die here. So much for being on normal. Wow. Oh boy, I'm going to have to reload here real quick. Sorry about that. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, think I got it'll keep going, though. I got wrecked. It, 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 What's that? I think it'll keep going with uh, Sophia and Kaji. Yeah. Would it? Yeah, it would have. But I, I, you know what? I, I'm a really weird player of these games, and I'm gonna. I'll, we'll, we'll talk. About, I think I actually got set back a little bit. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I think I also was down here before without. Uh, I think I had Kaji on the active uh, character, and he can't open doors, so I think I missed a lot of stuff entirely here. Uh, I'm probably playing this very inefficiently, um, and I do apologize for that. I think, yeah, I think the last time I came in here. I did not open these doors because I was controlling Kaji, and I don't believe he can open up doors. So that was uh, nope. not a good, not a good. I, uh, I'm, there's a whole bunch of enemies. What, one other thing to remember, Matt, uh, you, you probably do remember this, but mm -hmm. just in case, you can rest uh, at least in this part of the game as much as you want. Okay, yeah, before um, the spirit uh, spirit eater mechanic yep. comes in, I should yep. probably be doing that. Well, she's yeah, maybe I'll let her keep her spells. I mean, there's no bad thing to having for. We were talking about uh, the AI controlled. Um, Spellcasting, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have, uh, especially early on in the game. You can rest wherever you want, but um, as you go further down the game, you will really want to be a little more precise with what you're doing with these spellcasters. So, um, but yeah, we'll talk about the spirit eater mechanic definitely at some point before um, we we get done here, because that was also uh, certainly for me one of I you've probably heard the dialogue the the. the the back and forth on that for the last 15 years has probably been a little exhausting, but uh, there is kind of a thing where you will uh, periodically have to eat the spirits of your fallen enemies or consume their souls, even sometimes of um, intelligent enemies as well. And it is a meter that you kind of constantly have to be juggling. Um, as somebody who doesn't really like to have timers and meters in games, it was not my favorite part of this. Um, yep. But I, it, it definitely made sense thematically. Oh, here we go. I got a scythe now. That will make me much more impactful. Um, we'll get into it in a little bit, but I, I did uh, kind of... Let me get this guy set up real quick. So I am a scythe weapon master, and that is what I needed to use. Um, the one thing about the weapon masters that was kind of uh, criticized in Mask of the Traitor is that uh, it is a... a, a it is a class that's really based around a lot of um, high critical rolls and critical hits. Um, but unfortunately, when you uh, a lot of the enemies that you run into here are 
um, immune to critical hits. There's a lot of spirits, a lot of elementals, and that was one of the kind of things that uh, some of the guide writers that I have read about setting up this uh, special class is that you kind of lose a lot of the benefits there. But I still find it fun. I like getting like 100 damage hits five times in a, in a row. So <laughs> um, this is not for me. This is a medium armor, which I do not think I need right now. Let's see my game again real quick. I might actually need to use a restroom in a second. Um, and I apologize for that. Let's get through this little dot. Let me actually rest too as well. So I hopefully, I think in this little spot, you can't be interrupted, I think. Good, okay. So if you're not familiar with D&D, &D, every time you rest, you lose all your buffs and everything like that, but you will get back your, um, we'll get back your, all the spells that you memorize, uh, so they'll come back and you can go and do this. I'm gonna go ahead and buff both of us with stone skin and Bear's Endurance. The Bear's Endurance will give me more uh, hit points, I believe, and Stone Skin gives me a little more extra AC. And unfortunately, it also makes all your characters look like total weirdos when you have Stone Skin on. So yep. uh, all the screenshots I have of this game guide are just weird, glowy orbs of stone uh, from my entire party. So uh, it, it's one of those things where... Um, I really wish I could find a quick save button here. I'm not. Do you recall if there even is one in this game? I actually thought there was, but it's, it's been kinda, so long. I don't. Kind of feels like there must be. Let's take a look. Um, I don't even know if there is interface key mapping. Here we go. Game quick chat quick cast. Misc. DM. Camera move. I'm not seeing one. Maybe there isn't one. Quick cast. Dumb. Maybe there's not one. Oh well. We'll keep going. Oh boy, I immediately just, <laughs> I should, I, the thing is, uh, so if you're not familiar with, you know, D&D, &D, um, kind of the way things work, uh, is, uh, Kaji here is my uh, lock picker and everything else, but he is not a human being and he cannot, it doesn't have an inventory, I don't believe either, so he cannot actually interact with a lot of things, so um, you kind of want him to be forward facing to check for traps and everything like that. What is this? A scary rod. So greater dispelling three times a day. I will give that to give that to Sophia here. Sophia is going to be my identifier of all magic items that I find as the game goes on, which is super, super handy. But inventory management in these games has always been kind of a task. Um, it is something where you really do. I Say what you will about current RPGs, but there's one shared inventory that you can kind of constantly go back into. Uh, it's not very realistic, but it is very handy to uh, handy on the, the interactivity part of this kind of game. And Matt, I'm, I'm seeing something here that says F12 might be quick save. Let's see. Okay, wow. Well done. Oh, that's also a screenshot. So I'll have a bunch of screenshots here as well. Um, thank you for that. Sure. And there are Actually, it looks like Estwild in the chat did the same thing at the same time I found it. So Awesome. Thank you, Est, Est, Estwild. Let me check in chat real quick. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to use them in. Uh, put them in giantpalm.com slash chat. And again, we are trying to raise money for... Uh, Pencils of Promise. I'm going to put my fundraiser in chat again here. Uh, feel free to throw it in. Uh, throw in a donation if you like. Um, let me take a look at my questions here as well. So one of the things I, I really do find interesting about uh, Master of the Trayer is that a lot of the classic RPGs in the genre are the sequels to, uh, you know, get one game out of the way, you get the tech down, um, and then you make, you know, Baldur's Gate 2. Then you make your Fallout 2. After you have kind of, uh, nobody's going to say that Baldur's Gate 1 and Fallout 1 are not great games of their own volition, but uh, once you get the tech down and the tools down and everything like that, you kind of make your masterpiece the second time around, hopefully. Um, and I really think, um, but uh, Master of the Trade is really interesting because Neverwinter Nights 2 was kind of less of a real sequel to Neverwinter Nights 1 than it is kind of a, uh, an entirely new tool set. As far as I understand, um, a very much technical overhaul, a lot of, uh, much more kind of a focus on, at least for me, the reason I prefer Never One Nights 2 to 1 is that there's a bet much better narrative. Um, I Never One Nights 1 was very much felt more kind of a tool set for people to mod and make their own kind of stuff. There was a story there in a campaign that it was, it was fine, but I also, I felt like Neverwinter Nights 2 had a much more kind of co cohesive story throughout the uh, throughout the thing, but um, Master of the Trail really felt like uh, it was kind of the culmination of, I'm assuming you can speak to this better than I can, but yeah, I'm assuming having worked on Neverwinter Nights 2 for a couple of years, uh, getting this game made was hopefully a little simpler and allowed you to concentrate more on kind of the, the narrative thrust that you wanted to do. Is that accurate? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in when we were making the the Vanilla Never Wanted Nights too, um, it we're simultaneously getting the systems into place. Uh, some of our programmers were working on the tools. Um, there was a lot going on, and there was a lot of situations where we would be working on something, and we didn't actually have the tech yet. So then we'd have to go back and you know revise it and change it, and maybe something, maybe some. Uh, systems would get cut or changed and we'd have to do it again so there was a whole lot of that like sort of two steps forward one step back happening mm -hmm. whereas with this game um, we could focus entirely on making really good content um, and not only were, were there no like the ground wasn't changing under our feet but uh, in addition to that um, all the people on this team had worked together on act two um, so we all knew each other really well uh, we kind of had a good flow you know, with with ideas and, and the way we worked together already. So both of those things made it way, way easier to um, uh, to create this. Like, we were able to say, okay, Jeff Huskis uh, is going to be in charge of this, actually this level right here, this uh, the, the Barrow, and Eric Fenstermaker is going to be in charge of the Thay and Academy. And we knew, like, what everybody's strengths and weaknesses were. We could put people in just the right spots. Uh, it was just a... A way way easier and cleaner um, uh, process than than a lot of times you know with a new team and new tech and all kinds of stuff happening at the same time you're trying to create good content yeah I mean that was kind of the challenge for Fault New Vegas which I worked on for uh, the last part of my stint at um, Obsidian I think uh, the Bethesda engine that they had made we, we got those tools and I came on a little bit later in the game uh, obviously from development but trying to adjust to all that and the uh, insanely aggressive time uh, table that Bethesda had oh, for yeah. Vault New Vegas was notorious for, for you know everybody who worked on that project. It was uh, just kind of um, an insane amount of um, it was they, they wanted the game done in, in probably half the time it should have been. Um, and also <laughs> trying to learn all those new tools and everything like that was a challenge for everybody. I have made this salve, but I cannot figure out how to apply it to this Amaskari Golem. Do I need to put it back on the table or something? Let's see. You might, you might have to talk to the Golem. Oh, maybe. Let's see. Can I chit chat with him to see? Yeah, see? Is there a talk button here? Just he's uh, he's right click. He's part of my he's part of my party now. This is the thing, but I made this uh I made this sab to try to make him more powerful, but it doesn't look like I can give. Can you, can I, you right? Can you right click him? I can examine it. Let's see. To use this item, speak with your stone golem. Okay, okay. How do I speak to this guy then? Where's the speak button? I think you can right click your companions. I'm trying my best. Yeah. There we go. Didn't work? No. Hmm. It's interesting. Um maybe there's another speak button somewhere. Whoa, that's a that's a new camera mode right there. Strategy mode. Exploration mode. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, there that's must right. be a must be a button for, for talking. Can I talk you to can, her? You can definitely talk to her. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. Pardon my. So this guy, Kaji. Okay, now I'm just. I'm totally missing something here. Let's see. Talk. Go back to these game options real quick. I'm gonna ask you another question real quick. Um. Can, so, can you, good. Uh, can you right click on the um, the character on the like in the world as opposed to the, see. the portrait? No, that just might. kind of just kind of highlights them. I'm not hmm. sure. Yeah, it's really weird. Maybe I'm doing something. Is there, a, there must be a button I got to hit or something like that. Let's, let's yep. find this out real quick. Um, the other question I, I had uh, for you in reading uh, some of the, the development was that you obviously intended to make new races for this game, and you apparently listened to fan feedback, adding a couple of new elves and the elemental Ganassi. Am I saying that right? Ganassi, I think. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so you did, according to Wikipedia, at least it says you, you've listened to fan feedback about what they would like to see in Storm, uh, Mass of the Trayer. Was there was there anything else beyond just like the races and classes that you you kind of threw in front based on fan feedback from the first game beyond just bug fixes and things like that? Whew, yeah, that's <laughs> big question. <laughs> this might be one of those questions where I'll have to plead. Sure, no worries. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah I don't remember. I think there was. Well, actually, there was one thing. Um, so we did look at the popularity of the companions from the previous game mm -hmm. uh, in terms of who we brought back um, in this game. So there is one, toward the end of the game, one of your companions from the previous game um, can join your party, uh, and that was a result of fan feedback. 
Uh, I think we even looked at fan feedback in terms of who, sur <laughs> who oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, canonically survived um, yeah. the, the collapsed roof. So later on you'll find out, or you can find out, that some of the, the, your companions died and some of your companions survived. Uh, and that's partly based on partly based on fan feedback and partly based on who the internal development team like oh, yeah. and dislike. Sure. Uh, it's always uh, difficult to listen to fan feedback. I mean, it's really good to, to have, uh, obviously, CRPG fans are among the most passionate of any kind of uh, game out there. Um, but you, you look at the stuff, like I, 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 I haven't played WoW in a long time, but there is a, I believe... 20,000 plus page post on WoW uh, MMO Champion asking for them to add high elves to that game. Um, mm. So the people who get very, very... Like, for me, I, I'm i really a min-maxer in these kind of games. I mostly play them to win and do really well and get really powerful. So um, the RPG aspect of it is not like, like my driving force myself. So I kind of go with the things that are going to make me the best at spell casting or using... Um, using a, a big scythe or something like that so it's it's not something that i find myself like i i even like aesthetics for me or it's kind of like not a huge driving force for me in these kind of games um i find let me go this way um like i don't really spend a huge amount of time like making my character look pretty or anything like that so it's something that i understand that people care much about uh but for me it's just always been kind of um something that i i understand but i don't always you know pay too much attention to it so yeah um, oh boy here we go at least i have my stone skin on i always forget what this does constitution increased and this is ac increased damage reduction i'm gonna need to get some more so if you weren't paying attention during that whole little thing we found these golems and i have had uh resurrected him to join my party and he is going to help me fight uh, at least to the end of this barrow which is not a little bit more often a little bit more to we, go we explicitly added that that character um uh, because because of situations where uh, the player might have a caster PC, yeah, yeah, and I can the see that. Has a caster companion, and it's like, what am I going to do if I run into tanky enemies? And so we we tried to make sure we gave them yeah. at least one tanky character. It is good to have that uh, as all ins because, um, like I've said, there's plenty of game. There are at least a few games that I played where I generated a character, and the first character you meet is the exact same class and and build, yep. and you have a lot of stuff that you can't do early on in the game. Uh, I've actually gone back through character creation and like remade my character before. Uh, I'm going to take a quick restroom break if you don't mind, but I do have another question here for you. Um, before we go, I'll give you something to talk about while I. Or I am off uh, using the restroom real quick. So uh, here's a question about companions that I was really curious about. Um, all like party-based RPGs usually do have to have a fair amount of companions, and I was curious if you can t speak to the challenges of creating unique. Oh my god, my cat's going to come over here and start meowing. Um, the challenges of making like a unique cast of characters because it feels like we've all played you know a million CRPGs, and there are you know the standard kind of swashbuckling the dwarf soldier kind of stuff and it really felt like for Mass of the Trader there, there were a unique and very kind of varied uh, cast of characters and I wonder if you could speak to that being an actual goal or it just kind of happened based on your writing in the uh, writing to your environment or the story that you wanted to tell and I'm going to be right yeah. back if you want to chat about that for a second I'll be right back certainly so so yeah that was that was very much an intention with Mask of the Trader um, on, on Neverwinter Nights 2 um, we, this is again, this is the, the internal development team, we were very, um, we felt like a lot of the characters in Neverwinter Nights 2 um, felt like archetypes we had seen many times before. Um, so you had the, well the dwarf monk was a little bit interesting, but the most of the characters was like the elven druid and the human paladin. Um, and we very much wanted to be different and have a crazy cast of characters in Mask of the Betrayer. Um, so when I did sit down uh, to try to create uh, these characters and figure out who they were going to be, uh, my model was more uh, uh, Planescape Torment. Um, so in Planescape Torment, you've got uh, just absolutely crazy characters. You've got someone who's, uh, you have the, the tiefling um, well, back then a tiefling rogue was, was an unusual thing. Uh, you've got the Modron, uh, you have a, a succubus who, who doesn't like uh, uh, killing, or I guess doesn't like uh, using her powers um, as they would traditionally be, be used. Um, so what I tried to do was something very similar and have characters that, um, that would be unique and that the player would really remember. Um, so you had, I think, uh, actually, I 
Sophia might have been the first person I came up with because she was part of the plot. Um, but the bear god was was possibly the first or second character I came up with. Um, okay, I have back. I have uh, returned. Sorry the, about that. So I'm I'm actually still talking about uh, companions. Excellent. Good. Uh, I was I was just saying that uh, Sophia, uh, being a, a red wizard of Fae, is probably the most normal character in the game uh, in terms of companions. True. Um, um, and then we have the Bear God, uh, who I remember putting together uh, the stats for early on and like having an ungodly strength for him. Uh, and Chris Avalone, seeing, seeing the crazy stats that, that I put together, was like, yes, this is great. Uh, so I knew I was, I was on the right track. Um, and then uh, you had the, um, uh, the Celestial, uh, Kaylin, who was, you know, the, the crazy wings, and she's from one of the upper planes. Apparently she was almost cut. She was almost cut, yeah, and it was because of scope. Uh, yeah, it was because we just didn't have the writing scope to do uh, five. It was five companions, um, so we almost cut her, um, and we weren't sure what we were going to do with Gan. Um, but what ended up happening was first Chris uh, Chris volunteered to write Gan, uh, and then we were like, mm, we might not be able to do Kaylin, and she has the least. Um, she's very important in some ways, but you could you could technically do this plot without her. Oh, I can't uh, get but, but Chris really liked her, and so he was like, oh, I'll write her too. Um, so it, it worked out very nicely, and I think both of those characters came out really well with him writing. Holy shit, there are a bunch of people over here. I'm letting this golem kind of go yeah. walk up here and stand up and take on this fight, and let's see if I can get through here. Okay, good. Uh, you go ahead and get over here. I'm going to go and attack over here. Um, it just it always struck me, even from the first time I played this game, that how distinct and unique. Uh, especially, I, I love Aku. He's definitely my favorite of the companions. <laughs> yep. um, he's he's very much. I, I hesitate to say, but he does remind me a bunch of like you spoke about Japanese mythology, and I, it reminded me a lot. The Barrow and a lot of the the more colorful enemies reminded me a lot of like Princess Mononoke and and some of those yep. kind of yep. um, intentionally. Yeah, that was uh, he he was inspired at least partly by Mononoke. Yeah, that's uh, it's. He's a great character. I love his voice. Uh, great. I I don't actually know the voice actors for almost any of these characters, but I always remember that big big boom. But he and um one of many both had really interesting drawbacks as well. And I wasn't sure if some of these were bugs. I'd have to go back and take a look at my um, take a look at my game guide because I was bitching about it in the game guide that I wrote. Um, oh boy, you're so fast. Um. But it was really interesting because I know the scope uh, part of that is because you can really only get one of those two companions to play with, correct? Aku and one of many. Yeah, yeah, they're they're mutually exclusive. If you if you kill Oku, um, that actually unlocks one of many. Yeah, and that was a really interesting thing for me because when I played these games, I had a lot of experiences with. Um, I'm gonna rest here real quick. Reset. I am a compulsive quick saver, so I apologize if that pops up too much, but um. Uh, for one of the things for me is writing writing as a where are you? I'm gonna get your buffs off this side here and stack them up. And luckily you can kind of cue these things up and just start them going. This is always especially like Baldur's Gate two, Ice Dale two. You just spend a lot of time after each rest uh, to kind of cast all these buffs and kind of stand there around waiting. I'm gonna. I think somebody said the mass spells were in level six. I might see she might not have them. I didn't see them in her spell book, but let's check and see. Level six, don't see him, so she might need to learn those later on. Um, one of the things for me as a as a game guide writer is that you know you really do want to have a kind of a comprehensive look at. Um, oh, sound like a cat fight out, cat fight outside. We have a couple of strays that we took in a couple of years ago, and they were always getting little scraps of the neighborhood cats. So I apologize. Um, one of the things for me as a game guide writer was that. Uh, you know, uh, you really do kind of want to have explanations of as many different kind of branches of the story as you can. Obviously, in something like this, it's not always possible. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, quick saving and quick loading, especially in uh, in dialogues, because of the influence system was a big part of that as well, because... Um, you do have, as somebody who does play kind of as a min-maxer, um, you do kind of want to make sure that you're not doing anything that's going to piss off too many of your... Uh, companions because the influence system in this game you will I, I, I didn't get too far down into the negative aspects of it because I was you know min-maxing and making them very happy as much as I could um, but it, a lot of things that you do in dialogue will influence your companions and make them either like you or like you more or like you less um, so as a I think, 
Go ahead. I think we we were actually the first, um, or at least sort of Western D and D type RPG to do this, mm -hmm. where um, previously the influence system at Obsidian would unlock more dialogue options, but yeah. it didn't really affect anything gameplay wise. So that was very much an intentional choice, where as you're you know as you're uh, improving influence, you're actually gaining systemic changes as yeah. well. It's interesting, and it's um, one of the things that I, I kind of also help, couldn't help but notice that maybe, uh, and I don't know if this was intentional or not, but Gan and uh, Sophia both are kind of neutral alignment-wise, which makes them easier to not piss off when you're going through the game if you're playing on a extreme kind of alignment um, choice, which I, I assume was kind of an intentional one to make sure that you're not like kicking somebody out of your party for being lawful good when you're chaotic evil right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, we wanted we wanted the evil playthrough for obvious reasons to be very viable. Yeah, um, because we had a lot of like fun stuff that we did for evil characters. Um, so yeah, we wanted to have like especially the most important characters plot wise um, to make sure that they wouldn't exit your party if you did something evil or, or good. It's always a weird challenge to do. I mean, I don't play often as an evil character. Um, I don't play it super often. I, I kind of, you know, I always, I think a lot of people do the same thing where they kind of, oh, I'm going to make a bad guy. And, and then your first time you have to kill a group full of kids on a school bus or something like that, you're kind of like, oh, I can't really do this. <laughs> um, so most of the times I do play pretty good, but this was one of the few RPGs that I really did. And I'm sorry if I'm kind of moving very slowly here, but I'm so paranoid about traps now that I kind of do this thing where I just move it up a little bit, click a couple of clicks. Um, and see if there's a trap, and then just quick save your game. It's probably probably not the most fun thing to see, but this is the way I play these games. Um, always lead with your trap uh, person. Um, so if you're not familiar with what we're doing here, we are trying to open up a door that has been blocked by the spirits. You're trying to gather some, um, looks like animal, kind of sounds like a witch kind of stuff, where you have to find some animal remains and other things to burn on top of that bear skeleton. Am I back where I started off? I am back where I started off. I don't think there's anything for me to do here. So I took a wrong turn. I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, so the evil path in here is really interesting because you, you said that you didn't really want to make it kind of, you know, cackly, um, yep. you know, destroy the world. And, and you also said that, you know, this this whole game is less about saving the world than it is about, you know, things that are very directed towards the player character. Uh, you have had some kind of awful event happen to you and you've been obviously infested with this kind of... Um, spirit eater that is uh you know slowly you don't know this yet but slowly going to kill you um and so it is much more kind of a both personal but also uh, also immensely kind of uh, epic in the same way like you really do go places in this game you start talking to gods of Faerun and and gods of i'm a little bit lost here but um you start talking to you know oh boy here we go oh run away <laughs> So it is uh, really is somebody who you know does oh don't kill Kaji. I hope my the only thing now is I hope my oh there's the uh, golem going at it. Okay, let's all get going here. Um, you do have uh, uh, this from the uh, humble starts in this cave here, fighting ghost dogs. You will eventually start fighting. You know I I picked the army the battle at the end. So you do start fighting, you know, demi liches and huge beholders and things like that. It does, it's a very satisfyingly epic conclusion to this storyline, I would say. Um, and I don't know what my point is here. I think I'm just kind of rambling on now. Um, but I, I was, I'm always kind of curious how you, we've talked a little bit about how you, you've had some restraints in terms of what you couldn't couldn't do at the end of this game. But um, the realm kind of um, realm hopping at the end and going to the city of judgment and everything like that felt just so epic in terms of scope and everything like that. I was I was curious if it was like difficult to pull off in terms of, you know, scoping the game out. I have a totem now and I think that's one of the things I need to burn. No, that's a what is this thing? Is this something I just keep my inventory? I think you can equip that. Seek the might be in a, like a trinket spot a slot or something. Doesn't look like it. it. Looks like I just have it here. Improve huh. saving throws mind affecting and will plus three. Uh, yeah, it's not highlighting anything for me to put it in. So, uh, Interesting. I'll, I don't remember that not being equipable, but maybe it's... Yeah, it's weird that very few things in these kind of games are just like holding your inventory for a, a buff. Yep. When you find those things in like Diablo 2, they, they were uh, extremely powerful. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the end of the game... Oh, 38 damage, come on. It's not that much, but um, so the end of this game, you do start off in kind of a, you know, like you said, this is a this is a, a cave. You kind of have an interesting adventures through the uh, Academy of Thay, 
Um, and then you go off to the, the the grand finale. And was that a difficult thing to do? I mean, as a writer, you probably weren't as involved in the art pipeline and everything like that. But it, it seemed like the asks at the end of this game were pretty substantial for an expansion pack. Like, you do some pretty epic stuff. And I was curious if you could speak to any of that. Yeah, no. And, and I actually was involved pretty closely with a lot of that because it, it was such a small team that even though I was uh, narrative lead, which ordinarily is, is a lot of writing, um, I was working very closely with uh, the artists and um, sort of doing, you know, lead design-y kind of stuff too. Sure. So um, it was, uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. So like we, um, we were smart with the amount of stuff that we tried to do. And like I mentioned before, it was, um, it was also a team that had worked with this tool set and knew really well what could be done and what couldn't be done. Um, so a lot of it was like, you know, what can we do? Like, how can we create the City of Judgment and, you know, go full Paradise Lost at the end? Um, you know, what what might a Thane Academy look like? So we yeah. were very smart with the use of assets. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it turned out not to be, not to be super difficult. Um, one of the things about Mask of the Betrayer is despite the, the epic epic level, epic scale of things. Um, we got everything done on time, on budget. Um, we really, we did work hard. Uh, there were a lot of hours put in, but um, there really wasn't any like going over, over time or over budget or, or any of that sort of thing. Good, that's interesting. I mean, I obviously with Neverland Nights, um, the engine was built to make people uh, create their own campaign. So you kind of as you build the tools, you build the the ability because that has to be part of the shipping game. I'm assuming a lot of the tools that people use for modding and creating their own campaigns are the same things that the artists use to to create the levels in here, which I think in Neverwinter Nights two pulls off better than Neverwinter Nights Never Winter Nights one did. I think Neverwinter Nights one was a, it's kind of a, I mean it was an amazing game at the time, but it also kind of felt a little bit less of a kind of crafted experience in something like Baldur's Gate 2 where, you know, you have those mm -hmm. gorgeous painted, painted backgrounds and everything like that. This is definitely more never when it's one-ish, but it, it feels a little bit more... I hate the word polished, but that is um, um, one of the things that I would apply a little bit more to this game. I'm sure some people have other opinions, but... Um, so here's the first mission of Aku, I think. Um, he is the bear spirit that has kind of both uh, trapped this uh, Orglash here, and I forget if I'm supposed to fight this guy i think i do you you can actually do uh, a number of different things with this okay. guy there's there's multiple ways to get to the next level mm -hmm. um this guy is one of them so you can i believe you can make a pact with him and it looks take like him with you yeah let's do it i'm gonna go i command you to serve me um or i could just fight him i'm gonna go ahead and oh so he's now in my he's now in my pack okay so a lot of the times i think um for there's a lot of weird min-maxing too as well between um, killing things and not killing things in, in these games. Like sometimes I forget which game I was doing a big, I did a big long walkthrough for. Uh, it might have been, I don't know, the, the Oblivion or one of the KOTOR games or something like that where you're always kind of min-maxing the amount of experience you get from any given encounter. And sometimes that means killing everything in sight and sometimes the kind of... Um, sacred pouch i'm kind of talking and not at the same time not playing a super amount so ring of the frozen falls is what i got here let's see what this does cold immunity not bad hypothermia and polar array you can use that oh you already got two rings though ring of wizardry to bring protection that sounds like a couple of good rings to have i'll keep this one off for now um Okay, so I think I think I might be about ready to move on from this area, and maybe I figured if this is the middle bear, there might be another one up top. Um, yeah, there's there's one more. We'll see, I I didn't know how what to expect when I started this stream up today, and how far I'd be able to go. I, I feel very good about the conversation and my my um, ability to move through these levels, and uh, you know the UI is definitely something that it still takes a little bit of time to get used to. But I did spend a lot of time playing these games back in the day, uh, as you can probably imagine. Like writing a game guide for something like this is pretty exhausting I, I would say it's very fun i mean i really enjoy playing these games a lot but uh especially in something like this with so much reactivity which is uh, another thing that you've spoken a lot about how with your companions you really wanted to have um a fair amount of reactivity did i get this one i did not because there's a big bear 
And you're going to die very quickly because I have my scythe, Weapon Master. So the, the Weapon Master is an epic, not an epic class, but it's a uh, kind of specialized class. You need to have a lot of uh, ranks in fighter to get it or fighter or barbarian uh, a base uh, kind of really it has to be very specifically made that's one of the f- weirder things about this game and maybe D D in general but if you don't prepare a character from like very early level to get some of these uh side classes it's pretty easy to miss because this character needs like 13 intelligence and 13 dexterity which is not something that you're often going to see in a um fighter because uh, intelligence isn't super no oh. Can I cast Identify Spell? Take a look. Um, so doing the kind of uh, making a weapon master is uh, kind of kind of a lot of a lot of planning ahead of time. Luckily, with the character creation in Master of the Betrayal, you can kind of just go ahead. That is a lot of AC for maybe for her. Let's see her if her AC goes up. It did not. I'm okay. I'll use the new one anyways. Yeah, there's there's also some semi confusing, uh, especially for those who haven't you know really played a lot of three five. There's some semi confusing um, bonuses and, and limitations. Yeah. Uh, where it's like you uh, certain things can't stack, like yeah. being a protection can't stack with different things, and it's just yeah, it's, it's challenging for those who haven't. played Definitely a lot. one of those things where you have to do. Uh, so if you're not familiar with how AC works in D and D, you do have to have you have natural evasion, you have uh, you know AC increasing like from armor, and then you have dexterity evasion bonuses, and some of those will stack, some of those will not. Uh, so it is kind of a challenge to like layer buffs in such a way because like druid buffs, like bark scan, I think is nat natural armor um and some of that stuff is just okay here we go how long oh i never went in here before okay spirits walk into tunnel is another way out we, uh, how long are the spirits maintain the wall what do you suggest uh we did this before something like this, this patch we found oh maybe oh it's a bowl like this wow okay uh, i'm gonna ignite this and i think that should get us out of here okay we're moving on to the third floor We'll see what adventure awaits us. I'm going to try to take a nap here real quick before we move on. Um, yeah, one of the, it's one of the things about D&D in general. I, I, I know I was reading up on your history and you are uh, D&D, AD&D 2.0 person, which was what I really broke my teeth on when I was a kid. Um, yep. Back in the, the days before they phase out Thaco. Um, and if you're not familiar with D&D, man, Thaco is one of the most kind of confusing. Uh, it, it, it takes a long time to get that around your head, which I was really glad that they just made it AC, a number that goes up uh, instead of something weird where you have to, you know, do a huge amount of math but um D &D has evolved so much over the years uh that it really feels interesting oh i should buff real quick um it's really interesting to trace the history of it through um the different systems that they've had and the games that they've made uh with it because it really felt like D D 4.0 was kind of custom made for video games like so much positioning and pushing and moving things around um and then they obviously the, but the classics of the genre were D D, you know two and three um i know i want to say i haven't played much of Baldur's gate three um i played a little bit of the early access i believe that's the latest are they still calling it D D or is it just like d20 now uh no i believe it's uh fifth edition D D. okay and then the Star Wars games, the uh, KOTOR was based on D20, which is kind of the, yeah, basically the same thing, but with without um, all the fantasy trappings of it. So, and then it's, but it's, it's been really interesting to see Wizards kind of seed a lot of the, um, seed a lot of the CRPG space to Paizo and, and, and Pathfinder because they haven't really done a lot of D&D stuff, to my knowledge. I mean, certainly not in the kind of the epic, um, single player RPG kind of stuff. I know Neverwinter, the MMO is still going strong. People are still playing that. I haven't yep. played a huge amount of that myself. Um, but it is I, a lot of what Hasbro does now is just kind of interesting in, in a lot of ways. Like I, I don't want to make you speak to any possible. I, I know you, you're working for Digimancy Entertainment. I know you haven't announced your project yet. Uh, I'm assuming from what I've gleaned, it might be based on some kind of Byzantine empire um but i you're very coy about what you're working on on your twitter feed and everything <laughs> like that but um 
for D and D to be the, the you know really the premier kind of RPG system for everybody or for most people. I mean, not to take away anything from Pathfinder or any of the other myriad um, RPG systems that are out there, but I know for most people, when you think of you know sitting down at a table and playing playing a, a role playing game, you're probably thinking the D and D, and for them to kind of not to really do much in the computer space in the last. You know, they made Dark Alliance and things like that. They feel very tangential, but they have kind of stayed away from really adapting their rule set to a computer game for a long time now. Um, it's been kind of curious they've to been, see. They, they've been very careful. So I, I've, I've talked to them a little bit. They've been very careful about um, what games uh, they make. I think they want to really carefully control how they represent their IP. Sure. Their IPs, I guess I should say. Um, so we're, we're not working on any D&D stuff mm-hmm. uh, at this time, just, just to kind of get that out of the way. Um, they, um, I, I personally would love to work on like um, a couple of their IPs, like Dark Sun mm-hmm. uh, or Ravenloft. Um, but uh, I, I don't think they're working on anything for those. I, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that they're... They're doing a number of things, but in terms of like this kind of a space, I think they're limiting it mostly to uh, Baldur's Gate three. And they might have something else happening. I don't know for certain. Like yeah. I know they started. They they have a studio that I, I think is at least partially owned by um, by Wizards. Uh, and I, I don't know what they're working on either. But they're being very careful. That's good. I mean, There's it's a lot of studios yeah. that would want to work with them. That was the interesting thing for me working on Stormzy here because we did have to answer to Batari Infograms, which was in France, and we had to, and being in California when I was at Obsidian, um, you are, I had to be at work by like, you know, 7 a.m. a couple times to, to do some of those phone calls. So Larian, I believe, is in, are they Larian French as well? Or are they Belgian? Belgian. To, Belgian, okay, yeah. Um, so those phone calls when you have to deal with a license holder and the, the kind of the back and forth. I have a feeling... I kind of have a feeling Larian's getting uh, maybe not you know too too much of a rope to work with, but I have a feeling they have such a, a, a you know um, everybody loves Divinity so much that I have a feeling they're getting a little bit of room to play in the in the properties that they are. Um, I'm really hopeful for Baldur's Gate Three. I, I, I was I felt that the early access portion of it that I played was very very difficult. I found the it's one of those games where kind of my problem with divinity as well like i kind of like to have um oh somebody behind me here too i kind of like to be able to have the option to grind if i want to to get some levels up and things like that which is not possible to do in divinity as far as i know you really only have so many opportunities to gain experience and if you um don't do it that way if you don't you know completely clear out all of the kind of uh enemy encounters you can only gain so much experience and what i like to do in games that are i find difficult is to kind of over level and and overcome the challenges that way like in bloodborne or something Mm -hmm. like that you can kind of just go out and grind and and get better through that even if your skills maybe aren't aren't on par with you know somebody who's really really good at one of those games you can kind of make up for it by doing that and larian kind of seems like they not their style, and uh, that's certainly a choice. And honestly, that hasn't always been the case in the Baldur's Gate games, anyways. And I don't think it's the case in here or any of the Neverwinter games where you can't really go out and grind. But it's kind of one of the things that I do appreciate as somebody who likes to have a little choice in terms of what they're doing in a game. Too, if I don't feel like the challenge level, rather than doing like just setting it down to story mode, which feels like really giving up, I sometimes wish I could just go out there and kind of, um, kind of just go out there and level up on some random encounters. So. I don't know. I'm I'm babbling on again. No, no. It's I mean so so uh, divinity the divinity games um, obviously put a lot of effort into making a very sophisticated combat system. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, you you do need to master that combat system yeah. in their games. Um, and I, I think I, I have not actually played the uh, the Baldur's Gate three. Um, uh, early access because I kind of wanted to save it for when the game. Sure. Comes yeah. Out. I, I highly um, recommend that. Yep, but um, I I would imagine it might be like that there too, where just like in the Divinity games, it's it might be less about leveling yourself up than it is about sort of figuring out how to really master the systems and and use them in the most effective way. Um, this is yeah. my guess based on playing previously. I mean, that was uh, the big thing for me with. Um I've tried a lot of other CRPGs, and I they a lot of the honestly, I I feel like both myself personally, I have uh, my attention span has really dropped 
precipitously over the last 10 years for whatever reason. Um, I really like my game. Yeah, I really like my gameplay sessions to be like kind of half an hour long, pop in, pop out, uh, play something really quick, which is why I play so much. Oh, shit. Ah, I'm just Uh just doing all these traps, man. Um, You're devious (laughs) over here. Um, So I feel like a lot of my taste for CRPGs is kind of it's been very tough, especially when you're talking about a new whole new system like Pillars of Eternity. I really did enjoy the parts of those games that I played. I I got a decent amount into one. I didn't get super far into two, but just learning an entirely new kind of system of mechanics and everything like that is a big ask for. um, And I play I play games professionally, like for a living, and it's still something that is kind of a lot to deal with sometimes. Um, Yeah. But I, it's one of those things where I, I always find D&D be, be pretty comforting. Like, it's still something that you kind of understand. I don't think I can equip anything on this guy, can I? Um, I'm going to start running out of room here in my, on my boxes. Does this guy have an inventory? I don't think he does. This guy has an inventory, but he's about to die. So I got to maybe make some room here. Oh, I got more. I got more slots here. Okay. I always forget about that. Pardon my burps. Um... But yeah, it's it's one of those things that I kind of really kind of regret. Like I, I don't have the kind of maybe a attention span to get through a lot of these kind of epically long games. I, I can play a I play long games fine. I beat Dying Light two for some damn reason. That was like a fifty hour game. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I know you can't speak too much about Digimancy, but you are definitely where you're kind of you're. I don't know. It's one of those things where I, I've read enough about you to know, like, kind of what you like. You, you're definitely staying in the RPG space. Yeah. So we're um, we're working on it's it's narrative focused games. Mm-hmm. Um, so the narrative is always the first thing for us, um, which means we want to come up with a really good story, a really good setting, and then create systems um, to to bring the narrative to life. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're not. Uh, we we will work on combat games, but we're not wedded only to combat games. Like sure. we're interested in in non combat games too, um, and it's going to be uh, it's it's RPGs, uh, but it's also RPG hybrid games uh, as long as they have strong narratives. So we're we're open to a variety of things. Awesome. Let me uh, real quick um, type my fundraiser back into Twitch chat and um, the chat over here. If you're watching this today on Sunday, we are trying to raise money for Pencils of Promise. It's a, a wonderful charity that is uh, raising money for uh, underserved classrooms overseas. And oh boy, you're falling. Oh boy, you're way behind. Is she? Oh, she's encumbered, I bet. Oh yeah, there we go. Yep, she is. Okay, I didn't see that part. I'm going to give some stuff over to... Yeah, come back to me, buddy. I'm going to have to give you some stuff. Where are you? Are you following me? There you go. Okay, good. Um, I did not notice that before, so she is going to have to unload some armor to my guy with 20 strength. There we go. Okay. I, think you, I think you actually can give equipment to the golem. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird because his movement speed has decreased too for some reason. I'm not sure why. Mm. He doesn't have anything right now. Um, that is very curious. He might just be slow. He might just be slow. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Totally, entirely. Trying to, trying to. I don't know if you've ever streamed before, but so you're saying narrative games uh, are going to be your focus, and you, you have obviously are yep. still kind of running silent for the moment, and I will respect that. But I'm also very curious as to see what you all are up to. So you're working with Kevin Saunders, who uh, obviously was uh, I worked with them pretty, pretty closely on Storm Busy here from within my role there, um, and you have some. I, I, I've only seen a few other people on your website, but I'm assuming you have a you've, your team is dispersed, is what I hear. Yeah, so we're um, we're remote only, um, which actually happened before COVID. So we we did we were set up to be remote even before the whole COVID thing happened, mm-hmm. um, and so we were uh, we were fine when when that did happen. Um, we've got people um, we have people worldwide. We actually have you know a number in the U.S., but then we have some people in uh, Estonia, and we have someone who's in the Ukraine, and we have someone who's in Thailand, and uh, a couple in the U.K. Um, all RPG developers. We actually have um, a number of people from the Disco Elysium team. Good. Um, who are uh, who are all very passionate RPG narrative type uh, developers, which is great. Um, and right now, so we actually have an, an interesting story from the, <laughs> from the last year, or two years, or whatever we've been around. Um, we had a project. Uh, it was a full project we were developing for a publisher. Uh, who, who cannot be named, mm-hmm. um, but uh, there was some internal issues at the publisher, and after mm, a year and change working on that, it actually got canceled. Okay. 
Um, so we had to scramble to find additional things to, to fund ourselves. Um, so currently we have a couple things, a couple projects that we're working uh, with other companies on um, that are in development. Uh, we also have an internal project, uh, which is the thing that you'll occasionally see the, um, the, hints. the hints about. Yeah. Uh, and then we have, uh, we've got another thing that we're, we're in talks with a, another publisher about that um, seems like it has a pretty good chance of happening, but we'll see. Cool. I mean, that was one of the things that I, the first day I started, not the first day, but one of the first things that I did at Obsidian was getting on the internet and uh, checking out all the pitches that they had had for things that were, you know, eventually not, never turned into games. I remember one of the things that um, I want to say, what was that Obsidian game they made a couple of years? Tyranny. Uh, I remember seeing a, a, a very early pitch for a game that sounded very much like uh, Tyranny in that in that you know 2008 when I was around. So um, pitching stuff and dealing with publishers. Are you trying to avoid the uh, Kickstarter route for now? Um, not not actively trying to avoid it, but Kickstarter. We're we're not in the days of 2012, 2013 anymore. Sure. Obviously. Um, so the odds of being able to, on Kickstarter, get enough money to make yeah. all or most of the game is very, very low. Um, so we are mostly doing publisher first, uh, but we're not ruling out Kickstarter at some point. So he's got natural... So this is one of the things where... Um, yeah, I, I mean, sorry, not to... to, to immediately pivot but kickstarter has had some really good successes i mean pillars of eternity was a big one as well but it does seem like um it does seem like when i see a game on kickstarter i kind of uh, usually i'm a little skeptical that it will ever come out um which is probably deserved you know you look at something like star citizen which is star citizen is that the name of that game Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, <laughs> oh man, I don't want to get piss anybody off, but yeah, that 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 alone is kind of a uh, you know a lot of these games are, are kind of scope creep and, and all that kind of stuff, and there have been some really big successes, but definitely in in kind of uh, odd ways. I'm trying to see if I want to have this one armor bonus versus Fey plus five natural. As we were talking before, this uh, amulet of natural armor will probably not stack with. I want to say bark skin is also. I wish I could click on these reductions to see what is going on here. I'm not sure that I can actually. Uh, is there a mm, boy damage reduction? There's no man. More tool tips required. Um, I think I'm about ready to move on to the last part of this uh, area here, and then we will probably call it a day. But um, anything else you want to talk about, Master of the Trail? I mean, I, it's it's a weird for. Uh, I feel like I hope you're not tired of talking about this game because it has been like 15 years since it came out and it does feel like kind of a um, it's kind of a seminal work in the RPG space to me at least but it's also something that I don't feel like is has the same kind of stature as something like Baldur's Gate 2 or Fallout 2 I mean it was an expansion pack to a game which inherently yeah. reduces the amount of people who are probably going to see it especially with some of the rougher critical critical reception to Neverwinter Nights 2 I think that the reputation of Masters of Cherry has um, grown so much over the years that it'd be hard to find a real hardcore CRPG fan who doesn't know this game and has played it but it is still one of those things where it's um, it it not that it defines you or anything like that. You've worked on many projects, but it is one of those things where I hope you're not like kind of uh, tired of being back, back to the old kind of stuff. Uh, and it's one of the things that I've been meaning to play for a very long time, which is why I thought of you and I wanted to talk to you about it. But I know you look like Josh Sawyer and his, uh, his Tumblr. He said, I'm not going to talk about Fallout New Vegas anymore. Um, I'm curious if you ever have that kind of reception or relationship to this game, or if it's something that you really do feel appreciation for having worked on it. I, I don't. Th this is this was a passion project for me. Uh, I don't get tired of talking about it because I really loved it and I really loved working on it. And I think it's it's the best example of what I always wanted in the game industry, um, where um, we came in. You know, the team knew what we were making. We were extremely excited about it. Uh, we got to do a lot of things without bunch of executives and people saying, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do this. You know, there wasn't micromanagement. Um, I think it's an example of what, uh, of how games can be made well. Um, so I, I don't get tired of it. I mean, I, I haven't played it in a long time, yeah. but, um, but I do, my memories of making this game are, are my favorite in the industry. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. We'll we'll talk about it before we get out of here. Uh, here's some meta magic stuff. So Sophia can only be. Um, can only be 
a wizard. She can't multi-class, and this is the one. I think Quicken Spell is one of those ones that I really maximize. It's probably also a big one. Um, I know these get... So, again, metamagic stuff is where you can put a spell into a higher level spell slot and have it be something that has much more power. I'm going to go right now with... Do I need practiced spellcaster? So is she? She's more of a generalist wizard, but she can't do evocation. I think is that correct? She's, is, yeah, she's a transmuter. Yeah. Um, okay. So it, it limits her a little bit. Okay. I remember there were some things that she can do. I think eventually I gave her some like improved like crossbow stuff because mostly I was using her to just ping away and buff. She's a great buffer. Give her that for yep. sure. Uh, I'm gonna go with a uh, maximize spell I think and try that one for now. And I'm gonna try to learn that, some new stuff. One. Yeah, uh, level six. Let's see if I can get some of these mass. Here we go. Mass, bull strength, mass bears endurance. That's great. Uh, cast it on everybody. Man, I should probably. <laughs> you really want to get the knife? Ah. No, oh, Jesus Christ. Fuck. Sorry, my dog. <laughs> I was in the middle of talking about something, and so all of a, all of a sudden it all went away. Morden Kane's disjunction, I think, is going to be really big, too. Um, I have not. Horrid Wilting is always one of my favorite spells in any of these games, but um, I should probably hold... What does it recommend, I wonder? Shape change? That's an interesting one. Um, I don't remember what you turn into with shape change. I'm not sure. Morning Cane is a disjunction. It's a big one to strip away uh, spell wards and everything like that because it will take away clubs and vulnerables, stone skin, mage armor, shadow shield, and elemental shield. Uh, I'm going to go back to something... Let's go to Horde Wilting. I've always liked Horde Wilting. And uh, this is 20 D6 worth of damage, magic damage. Yep. Um, and uh, since I can cast that on top of my own party when I'm playing um, uh, on normal mode, that might be one to think about putting on that old uh, spell book right now. Let me get some stuff here real quick. So real quick before we go, though, I wanted to talk about the Spirit Eater mechanic because um, sure. we, we will not be getting into this today, I don't think, because I think we're about to... Um, a stone to flesh. Okay, two bears endurance. I probably only need one of these, but um, probably won't be getting into it too much today because I don't think we're going to meet, uh, get the spirit eater going. But so the thing about the spirit eater mechanic, and I, I think we talked about it very briefly before, but um, was that it is a constantly ticking down kind of meter that you have, uh, and you have to eat uh, enemy spirits to raise that back up to a certain point. Like once a day, you're supposed to eat a spirit or a consum consume a spirit. And it's kind of a very interesting and in-depth mechanic between... Um, in-depth mechanic between both the lawful and evil and good because uh, some some consumed spirits is not uh, not necessarily a good thing um, but it's also as a mechanic i found it to be a little overbearing as a as a you know i i'm i'm kind of have a lot of anxiety around some things like uh, you know um timers and things like that in games which is one of the reasons i never finished like xcom 2 or things like that. And I'm curious about the internal kind of uh, discussions around it, where if you thought that it was, because it, it definitely was kind of received in a variety of opinions from reviewers, at least. Um, yeah. Did she lose her? Oh, she loses her uh, um, companion when you level up, I believe. So I'm going to go and cast this one here. Um, I was curious about the, the discussions around it. If anybody raised any kind of objections or was it kind of a, it, it strikes me, and I'm not trying to read too much into it, but it strikes me as one of those mechanics that might have been kind of controversial on the development team. I'm curious if, if it was or if I'm totally misreading it. Um, in, initially, I don't recall it being particularly controversial on mm -hmm. the team. I think in QA, it might have been a little bit. Um, but by the time it came online, we were also... And this this kind of gets back to the, you know, we really weren't creating new mechanics except for that. Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't too controversial, maybe until the very end. I think once we saw player uh, response to mm -hmm. it, it, it became a little more so. Um, I've gone back and forth on it over the years. Um, I think I, I'm with you where I think in an RPG where you actually want the player to explore and take their time and and you know learn story, uh, uh, reveal story, and spend time looking at you know or talking to characters and all that. I think. That kind of a mechanic does hurt that experience, um, but at the same time, it was a really cool way to to um, uh, gamify the whole weird addictive mechanic. Yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, it it's, works. It's not something. Yeah, oh, please it, go ahead. It works thematically for sure, um, and I yeah. think I'm I'm a little bit uh, definitely kind of more on the negative side of it in terms of like I don't want to have to manage that kind of thing when I play. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, go, go on to the, you're talking about it though. I was, I was really curious to hear about it because I did go back and look at some reviews of this game, and it was definitely uh, had a mixed reception. It's it's not something I would probably do again, um, but or at least not the way it was implemented. Um, but I do think that having some kind of mechanical representation of what's happening in a case like this is really important. Uh, I don't think it's enough because some games will do this where they just they just say you have a terrible wasting disease or whatever it is, and um, yeah, and, and that's it. It's purely narrative. I don't feel like that's enough. Um, so I, you you need some way to gamify it. Um, I think because of the kind of game we were, this ultimately was not quite the right way to gamify it because it. Um, disincentivized, dis- disincentivized the thing that we want wanted players to do, which was explore, yeah. and enjoy the world. And that was take quests. Yeah, that was definitely my thing with it. With the fact that it was constantly ticking down outside of uh, dialogue, yeah. I think it's the only place it really pauses. I've seen other games do some interesting things with like uh, there's a game called Core Keeper right now where you do have like a food meter, but it only goes down if you're actually moving around. Um, it's not constantly ticking down. I think the fact that it was constantly ticking down definitely made the experience feel rushed. Um, and I, yeah. I will be perfectly honest and say that I, I modded it out entirely the second time I played the game. And I felt I was yeah. much enjoyed it much more that way. And I'm not trying to knock it too hard. I, I it's, it's one of those things that I can definitely tell that the discourse around that specific me- mechanic has been probably... Um, Probably, probably well worn at this point, but uh, it was be I would be remiss to have you on a stream and not bring it up. So, um, yeah. let's no, go. it's yeah, it's it's absolutely right, and I think I, I would have probably done a, a, a variant of it uh, that probably didn't have the, the ticking down. Yeah, um, maybe maybe have it more on the player's control, where it's like only when you do certain things does it tick down. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a weird one. It's it's hard to because there are plenty of games that have like I I think Dying Light Two, which I when I when I played right very. very how, you have a disease that will kill you if you don't take medicine every so often and if you go outside yep. for too long. Uh, I think they manage it pretty well. Like you, If you're in sunlight, it doesn't affect you or anything like that. But the problem with that specific mechanic for Dying Light 2 is that they keep on having you like writhe in pain at uh, weird hours and it's just, but you know it's not gonna, it's just a storytelling tick. It's not actually affecting you at all outside of the mechanic that you have. So it's a complicated thing. I was, I was, I've always been fascinated by, the, by the, the design behind that, but um, I know I only have you for a few more minutes so let's go get Aku, and okay. I am going to try to save him. Oh, I love Aku. Yeah, me too. Him and Kaelin are my favorite. I mean, it's easy to love. It's it's very, like I said, Princess Mononoke. Big, deep voice, big. You don't see too many. Oh, boy, this is a bad camera angle right here. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm going to use my diplomacy. Nope. Whoops. Slay my servants. Devour my loyal friend, Nakata. I know what you are, but I smell the hunger that wakes in you. I don't care what you smell. You will not have him. Yeah. The, the stone skin uh, really does make conversations look so weird. <laughs> yeah. You don't know me. But I know your kind. I know that your present form, for all its color, is only a shadow of your true self. And I've shaped and bound far greater things than you. And I smell a wild storm in you, Thane. Does your ally know the secrets you hide? Grief and confusion beyond measure. And something more. Enough words. By the oath I swore. Neither of you will leave my den. Okay, here we go. I, again, on normal mode, one of the things I really have a hard time with some RPGs is um, the difficulty scaling between, like, normal and the one above it. I find that um, Divinity 2 had a very difficult normal mode for me, but then the Explorer mode is a little too easy, and I really find that some games do that very poorly um i did play these i believe i originally played this game on let me take a look at this guys oh boy sorry do were you gonna say something after that conversation uh nope nope not really okay um this is aku he's one of the main main companions to me he's one of my favorite ones in the game uh you do have a choice again at the end of this but i'm trying to take a look at his 
the combat log here because he's not taking much damage. I'm attacking miss 17 target concealed. Oh, so he's got 50% target if your targets are concealed. There we go. Now he's getting some stuff, and I'm going to make you cast that Horde Wilting right on top of him. I do uh, love his appearance. Yeah, he's, he looks wish, really good. I wish we'd had the budget to get more of the, you know, that kind of texture on these spirit creatures, like all these bears he just summoned. Oh, God um, damn it. And I just wasted and this my... Again, this, this is Justin Cherry who uh, who created the, uh, the Oku appearance. Oh, uh, it's fantastic. Oh, boy. Everybody's coming in. Oh, no. Uh, I'm going to try to cast this uh, Meteor Swarm here. Oh, I think I got him. Yeah, he's not super tough in this fight. I think there's a there's a lot of enemies here to go through. I'm not sure if they're yeah. going to dis disappear now or what, but there we go. There's that meteor swarm coming in. Don't have to worry about it for me. And you see, obviously, I'm not taking much damage here because of, you know, stone skin and uh, um, bear's endurance. So I guess bear's endurance wouldn't do much. I don't think... I'm not even sure these guys are really hitting me all that much. Oh, I better go help her, though. Um... Again, balancing this kind of stuff. I mean, KOTOR 2 is the same way where you had, if you're getting to level 30 in a D&D &D kind of system, um, it becomes very, very difficult to kind of make a game that's challenging, but also like at some point the challenge becomes like, do you survive or not? Because a lot of these, you know, you see it all the time in like MMOs or anything action oriented where it's a, that's more of like avoiding an attack than anything else or else it'll kill you in one shot. But in these kind of games, it's very, very difficult, I would imagine, to balance like very high AC versus enemies that attack for a huge amount of damage. And then if you if you somehow make a character that is less, um, you know, less... Um, than ideally constructed, which I've definitely done in Oblivion and some other games. Um, you can really ruin your entire... Like, if you make a bad character in this game and you kind of level up and don't pick, you know, complementary feats or anything like that, it is very, very feasible to imagine somebody playing far enough into this game that they can't really finish it. Um, yep. I think the difficulty settings obviously do that uh, to a way... I, I feel like I'm pretty competent at making um, characters in these games, except for like you know learning a new mechanic system. Like, uh, you know, Divinity 2 is very difficult to kind of... Divinity 2, especially, you don't really know how all the um, classes will interplay until you get further along in the game, and by that time, it's it's pretty difficult to respec sometimes because it does cost a lot of money to buy those spellbooks, but I'm going to save my game here. I forget get if I'm supposed to do anything else here, but I think I just walk out, right? And yeah, you can just walk out. Um, one, one interesting point about um, combat in this game, so actually the Spirit Eater mechanic, um, we partly came up with that mechanic uh, because in Neverwinter Nights 2, the original base game, it was just too easy to rest. Like, there was yeah. no repercussion yeah. of just resting after every single Oh, fight. man. Yeah. In order to make it an interesting fight, just you almost had to make every fight here. a potential party wipe. Yeah. But that's one of the interesting things I played. Um, let me get through her, her conversation here. Um, I got into a fair amount of trouble. Not a fair amount of trouble. I think I we did a quick look of Pathfinder Kingmaker a couple years ago, and I talked about um, – how some of the D&D &D rules are great for pencil, uh, pen and paper and not so great from, I can't remember the last time I've been in this much pain. I think this is where I get the spirit eater mechanic, correct? Or is it sometime uh, soon no, after? No, it's actually quite a ways off. After, and, and back to one, okay. Yep. We'll get to this conversation real quick, and we'll, I'll, I'll let you go. I really appreciate your time here today. Um, and I definitely, if I'm going to keep on playing this, I hopefully will get you back on at some point. But we will have to talk about it at some point in the future. I'm going to get to this conversation. And I forget what I was mentioning. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I was, I, we did a Pathfinder quick look a couple years ago, kind of a very short, like, hour-long look at the game. And I think I mentioned that I don't particularly like some of the – you know, endurance damage when you're moving too fast. Um, I kept on resting in the forest and getting attacked by wolves so I couldn't restore my spells. I get the limitations that that kind of stuff is supposed to in engender in terms of a, um, you know, you do need limitations. Like you said, if you just rest after every combat, it's basically you're always at full power and there has to be some way of tampering that down. Um, but I don't know if I've ever met like a really good one, to be honest with you. Like it's uh it's one of those things where I do feel like I I wanna have my I don't wanna feel like worn down by endurance and, and getting tired in a video game. It always strikes me as being kind of a, a weird 
um, maybe I'm too invested in the power of fantasy of uh, these, these kind of games, but um, yeah, I remember that being very specific in that kind of uh, Pathfinder system where they very much, especially in Kingmaker, really did uh, kind of adhere to a lot of the pen and paper rules. I think in Wrath of the Righteous, they had a lot more sliders and let you kind of um, decide for yourself how what kind of stuff you wanted to have in terms of difficulty settings and everything like that. And I felt that that was uh, very, very nice of them to do. Um, but yeah, this is Mask of the Betrayer. Uh, I have just started my journey here. Let me make a full save here because I don't feel like I've done that in a while. And that is always a dangerous thing to do, to not make real saves before you leave a game. Um, but I really appreciate your time here today, George. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun to uh, to see you playing through this. Um, obviously, it's been a long time since I worked on, on Mask, so some of this is is me remembering yeah that, uh one of the best things is always even just to, to grow as a designer is watching somebody else play your game and see what they do yeah i mean i, they I like where they go wrong and all that so, i think we did some of that with uh, alpha protocol and and just um yeah it's always infuriating when somebody doesn't do something right the first time but then you know you have to go back and make it more clear so yep, you, um you learn a lot yeah well, I am going to stop this recording right now. This will be live on Giant Pop at some point in the future, probably tomorrow. But I really do appreciate your time, and I'm, I'm going to take a little step away for a second. I'll keep streaming for a little bit here in giantpalm.com slash chat. Again, if you would love to, uh, if you would like to donate to Pencils of Promise, uh, the link should be in our chat room again and on Twitch again. Um, and please do hop over there and maybe throw a couple bucks there if, you, if you'd like to. Um, I got $176 today. Uh, that's not bad. More than I thought. Or I, I set the, the goal for a thousand bucks, but um, I did. I should mention that Red Ventures, the owner of Giant Bomb, will be donating two thousand dollars to the Giant Bomb team for Pencils of Promise. So we will hopefully get pretty close to our goal after that comes in at some point in the future. Uh, thank you again, George. Uh, we look for. I personally really look forward to see what you come up with uh, over there at Digimancy Entertainment. Um, thank you. If you have anything else you'd like to plug, your Tumblr or anything else, that that would be the time. Uh, well, we've got we have our Twitter that's up. Mm -hmm. um, you have a Reddit too. Uh, what was that? You have a Reddit as well. I saw your subreddit. We do. Yeah, we have we have Instagram. We have Reddit. Um, we we actually brought somebody in recently who's been uh, taking over our uh, our social media because uh, I'm woefully bad at it. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm, Holy I'm, mackerel! I'm going in. I'm going in like you know four different directions all the time, <laughs> so it's uh, it's hard to keep up. But he's he's really on top of it. Good. Yeah, we've got we'll have Instagram posts. Um, uh, Reddit and uh, gosh, what's the other one? Uh, oh, Facebook as well. We're on Facebook. Excellent. And it's usually at at Digimancy Games. Company's name is Digimancy Entertainment. Um, and at the moment, we can't actually talk about any of the things that we're doing, but um, you know, we're working with some cool partners, and and hopefully we'll have uh, some more things to talk about on the internal project later in the year. I will see you at E three. I bet at some point. Uh, you, you might. <laughs> I was at GDC. I don't know whether I'll be at Oh, you're at GDC. I, I always, um, GDC is always weird for me because I'm in the Bay Area. I used to work like right down the block from it, but um, I've never really, this year I don't think I bothered to get a pass. I would like to, I'd love to hook up with Josh Laurier again. He's like the, one of the old uh, Obsidian grognards that I have kind of kept in touch with on Twitter and, and things like that. But um, yep. Yeah, it's I been. Know if he went to GDC this year, I believe he. I, I'm not sure if he's been going lately. I'm. I want to say he did because I remember his Twitter feed. I think he. I think he did. Um, I believe he was uh, posting some pictures and such. But it's really not. You know, as a, I, I don't even call myself a journalist anymore. It's like a really much more kind of we we stream and we try to be entertaining. Um, GDC 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 feels much more like a kind of a. Uh, you know, it's for game designers and business people, business deals to get done. And I always feel a little bit like an outsider there. More E3 is more my style, but we'll see if they ever have I, one again. I was, uh, I was actually mostly there for, for business deals this year. Um, I, I did not actually get onto the, into the floor cause it's, yeah. cause it costs a lot, Yeah, uh, but yeah. it was still a very good experience. And I saw some people that you know, I hadn't seen in a while. So it was fun. At some point, we'll have a big Obsidian reunion. Uh, it's not yeah. like I'd be the, the least important person there because I was only there for two years. But um, well, again, thank you so much for your generous uh, donation of time here today. And if I keep on going on with Master of the Chair, I kind of, I kind of want to keep playing this. Maybe do some, uh, do a little longer extended play of this. But we'll see what the future holds. But I will let you get back to your normal Sunday. I'm going to take a little break real quick, and uh, I will be back streaming very shortly after we get done here. I. I hopefully I, I didn't hit stop recording so 
I'm going to do that now <laughs> as we fade out. Uh, thank you again, George. And we look forward to seeing what uh, comes out of Digimancy in the future.